So do not grudge. Now, what happens when I put these four things together? When I'm controlled by the Spirit, when I'm walking in the Spirit, and when I am not grieving the Spirit, and I'm not quenching the Spirit. You know what will happen? The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will come in my life. People want to have the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And he said, there's no law on these. That's what you want, right? That's a picture of Christ-like living. A life that's filled with love and joy and peace and patience. And Those aren't natural characteristics. Those don't come from the old nature. And you can't produce fruit. Fruit is not produced by us. Fruit is produced in us and through us by the Spirit. We provide the conditions, not going to be automatic, that's for sure, but it is a beautiful, quiet, progressive transformation into Christ-likeness. Those qualities start emerging, not by us, but in us and through us by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I say, you know, the Christian life is so simple that we stumble over it. We try to make it difficult by doing this, doing that, and all these other things, when really, when you uh, distill it down, it is simple. I don't mean that it's easy. It's difficult. It's impossible to live. And God knows that. But it's simple if we do it God's way. But so often, we want to do it our own way. We want to figure out our own strategy for living the Christian life, and you're back to suppression, or in some cases eradication, instead of allowing that counteracting work of the Spirit of God through us. But that's the power source, and what I believe happens as this becomes a pattern, and it, you have to learn it. You'll be walking by Spirit, then you quit, and you realize you've grieved the Spirit, and you have to come back, but you just be conscious of these things. And then what will happen is more and more you'll resemble Christ. And I am convinced that the world, the non-Christian, is not impressed by the fact that you say you're a Christian or that I have a relationship with Christ. Well, they say I have a relationship with Muhammad or Buddha or whoever. That means nothing to the non-believer unless they see resemblance to Christ. That's the argument. People are attracted to that. There was a man that uh, was a neighbor of ours and he was a non-believer and uh, we began praying for him and very concerned about him coming to faith in Christ. And I gave him books to read. I gave him C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. I gave him some other intellectual books because he was an intellectual. And uh, I talked with him and all the rest. And one night he called me on the phone and he said, can you come over to the house? Sure. Went right across the road to his house. And he said, I want to accept Christ tonight. And I want to do it as you, as my witness. Let's get down on our knees and pray. He said, I have to get down on my knees for this. Great. I asked him later, I said, what was it that really brought you to Christ? Was it C.S. Lewis and his great arguments? Was it these other books that I've given you? This apologetics? He said, no, it wasn't any of that. He said, that was interesting. And, and I, 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 I liked it. I read it. But that wasn't it. I said, well, what was it? He said, it was your son. I said, my son? He was young at that time, maybe 12 years old. I said, what did my son do? He said, nothing. He said, but I watched the way that he played with my, other, with my son. 
and I watched the way he conducted myself. And I know kids, he was a teacher. And he said, I knew it had to be something different. And I could see Jesus in him. His love, his peace, his patience with my son, the way he acted and reacted. He said, I knew it had to be something real. I knew he came from a Christian home. So I knew there had to be something to this Christianity stuff. And I saw it in him as I watched him day after day playing. He was kind. He didn't use vulgar language. And there was something different there. And that's the way it is. People look. And they are not impressed with our labels, with where we go to church, the fact that we carry our Bibles. But they're very impressed if they can see the likeness of Jesus Christ in us. And that's not going to be produced by us. That's going to be produced by the Spirit of God. And that's why he has given us the Holy Spirit. I want you to keep these four things in mind that we have talked about. Our responsibility, and it is our responsibility to be controlled, to walk, to not grieve, to not quench the Spirit. But a further study that would be very beneficial is to take Romans chapter 8 and read it and reread it and memorize sections of it. And I know people that have memorized the whole chapter. It can be done. And it's a powerful, powerful statement about the work of the Holy Spirit. Nineteen times in these 36 verses of Romans 8, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. Take a highlighter, highlight every time you see the Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. And you will see that what we've been talking about is really the way it has to be. It has to be the Spirit. But also go back and read a bit of Romans chapter 7. Because the Apostle Paul writes about that conflict that he has, that inner conflict. He's a believer. He's writing this as a Christian. And here's what he says. He said, I know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. I am sold as a slave to sin. I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me. That's in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For what I do not want to do, I do. And what I, the good I want to do, I don't do. I, he's just describing himself as a civil, walking civil war. He said, now if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me. And I can't conquer it. He said, I hate it. I know it's wrong. And he said, I'm unspiritual. I am a believer. But I have this constant battle with my old sin nature. I don't know what to do. I can't do what I know I should do and what I want to do. Then, after you read that, you go right into Romans chapter 8. I said, I get it now. I get it. I can't do it. But I have the Spirit of God in me. And he can do it. This is what he says, part of Romans 8. Uh, I encourage you to read the whole chapter. It's, it's a marvelous, marvelous chapter. Kind of the high mark, I, I think, uh, in, in the entire scripture. But here's what he says, beginning with verse 5 of Romans 8. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit, in accordance with the Spirit, that's walking with the Spirit, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It 
does not subject itself to God's laws, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit of God. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. But Christ is in you, and your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And so on and so forth. In, in Romans 8, you get the point. Is your mind and life going to be controlled by the sinful nature or by the Spirit of God? One way or the other. The choice is ours, but we want the fruit of the Spirit. We want that Christ-likeness. We want our lives to make an impact. We want people to see Jesus in us. And that's not going to happen if we live according to the sinful nature. But the good news is, God has made every provision for us through the Holy Spirit. Now it's our choice, our responsibility to cooperate with the Spirit of the living God. And all that we've talked about in spiritual formation, it's spiritual formation being formed by the Spirit. Spiritual formation is not a work of the flesh, it's a work of the Spirit of God. We talk about the untroubled heart and experiencing that. And how do we do all the things? Meditation even. I need the Spirit's enablement to even meditate on the Spirit, uh, on Scriptures. I need His illumination. So all that we've talked about in these lectures on the untroubled heart, I leave this lecture to the end because I know that's what's going to make everything else work and help make sense out of it and help you live it if you're empowered by the Spirit of God. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.